I, I think you have to find the balance of what you have. Health plays into it. Do I have healthy running backs? Do I have healthy receivers? Do I have a healthy offensive line? Is my tight end capable of blocking on the, on the edge? You know, those are all things that I think you find out as a coach. You know, this will mark the fourth time that Jalen's had a new play caller, too. We're going to hit on that with our friend. I want to read something here to you, though. I've been going through the book here. Joe Theismann's book here, How to Be a Champion Every Day. And I love this. After the final seconds on the scoreboard ticked down, the fans may remember a few of your greatest plays. They may remember that amazing play in the Super Bowl, but more than anything, they will remember you. You decide right now how you want to be remembered then live every day like you're playing your final game. I would even more so say your final play. And I, I love stuff like that because, you know, sometimes people look at that stuff and they think of it just being coach speak and it's on a, on a chalkboard. And I just remember being coached by Jimmy Johnson. And I just remember him making all those comments and positive attitudes and never – having anything in the building that was negative. But I'll tell you what he did do. Hard work will always supersede anything else. And hard work makes those words come to fruition. You know what you, you know what Joe Theismann, when he writes those words, those are blind faith words. You have to have blind faith when you listen to a coach. It's like religion. Before I bring Joe on, I stood in front of Notre I st Before we played Notre Dame, I went just like this to our guys. How many people in here are religious? They all put their hand up. I'm religious. I said, well, when you believe in your coach, it's almost like a religion. It's blind faith that he's going to take you to a place that you want to be. You have to believe in it. And I'll tell you what, I'm finding out even more and more about my good friend who is friends with some of my friends. Let's bring in the former NFL MVP. Football champion and Monday Night Football host too, our friend Joe Theismann. Joe, how you doing, friend? I'm good, Daniel. How are you, Joe? I love the book, man. I and I, I keep it right next to my desk. And Thank you. Kind of like you know, I'm going through some stuff. I'll pull a quote out here. I'll start reading some of the things. I mean, it's you know, been Joe, an, you live your life by this. I would think I do, Dan, and it's been an interesting life, and I enjoy sharing some of the stories, both those positive things that have happened in my life and some of the other things that, you know, that I did that, uh, that weren't so positive. And I think that's the way you learn. I mean, you just, I'm not a rear view mirror guy. You've heard me say that. I, I only look back just to see what I can learn from what happened back there. Uh, I always try and look forward and see what you can do. And you've heard me say this and, I, and after my injury is when it really became obvious to me is that we're not put on this earth to be served but we're here to be able to serve others. And, you know, mentorships, the ability to be able to help people, um, that's why we're here. And I think if we use that as a goal moving forward in our lives, we have a chance to have a pretty, pretty good life. You know what? I, I heard Tom Brady the other day mention something about being a teammate. And he goes, the reason that you play long in this league is because it was so imperative for me to be the best possible teammate I possibly could be because sure. I get all the accolades. I get all the money. I get most of the fame. I get all of this and being humble, Joe, and being a good teammate in his eyes was the most important thing that he could stress to young players. And I look at Jalen and I look at a lot of the young players in today's NFL. Do you see that trait being exhibited enough by some of the younger players that go in today's NFL? I think, you know, Dan, I think it's a great question. And I, I think it, what the interesting part of it is I almost think it's too early to tell with young guys because they're really, really trying to just focus on becoming number one, a professional. How, how do I become a professional? What, what are the habits I have to adapt? What are the things I need to do? Uh, what are the things I need to work on? Um, 
And, you know, this is something Mike Tyson told me at an autograph session about three or four years ago. We were talking about life, and it fits into this category. And he said, Joe, if you don't find humility, life will find it for you. <laughs> and, and I don't believe any truer words have ever been spoken for so many of us. And I think Tom has just a, such a great perspective. I mean, he nobody worked harder. Nobody tried to be any better than Tom. I mean, he, he put everything into it. And th that's where you become a good teammate. Our job is to try and help other guys go to greatness. And we're just, we're just sort of facilitators at the quarterback position. And I think Jalen, you know, making the decision to leave Arizona state, going to LSU, um, the relationships down there, Mike Denbrook, who was the, who became the offensive coordinator, just really, uh, I think, tip the scale for him to go there because of the type of person he was. You know, this is the thing that I think happens at the combines. That's more important than anything. I don't care how fast you run a 40. I don't care how much weight you lift. Um, I care how you throw a little bit, but what do you like as a person? How much time can you spend with a young man and find out what kind of a person you're dealing with? You know, the movie draft day with Kevin Costner is, is a pretty telling story about some of the process that you go through when it comes to the draft. You know, who are you going to get? Who are you adding to your football team? What is the type of, what's character? You know, character is who you are, Dan. Reputation is who people think you are. And I think, you know, the, and, and Tom, you know, Tom has such a great, has such a great grasp of this game. It'll be interesting to watch him as he starts his broadcast career. You know, are you more drawn, Joe, because of your type of journey, like, a Warren Moon journey, a Jaden Daniels journey where, you know, first round draft choice, and not that he's not a first round draft choice. Obviously, Washington takes him with the number two pick. But are you more drawn to those kind of guys? Because when you came out of Notre Dame, you had to go through a different journey. Hell, Joe, you were on a kickoff team. I mean, you you were you were actually running down guys because you had Kilmer, probably Jurgensen was there and all that. You're you're running guys down. So are you more drawn to like say even like a like a like a uh, a Jalen Hurts who got had his job taken away? He had a transfer. He had a second round pick. He had a go. Are you more drawn to that because it's it, it's a better litmus test on who that guy is and where he's been and where he wants to go? Not necessarily drawn to it, but I certainly can understand what they're going through and the process that they went through to get where they are. But I mean, you, you look at Troy Aikman. You look at. Um, Peyton Manning, you know, it doesn't matter where you're drafted. I like to get to know the person. If I can get around the person a little bit and get a feel for how they feel about the game, their aptitude towards the game, their, their willingness to be able to learn about the game. Um, then you can start to get an idea what type of a young person you're dealing with. And you can almost sit and say, you know, what are their chances of success? There aren't, there aren't me people that make it in this game, Dan. That it just doesn't work. There's too many people that rely on you and you rely on too many other people. So it has to be about being a part of the puzzle, not the entire puzzle. And, and I think I, no matter where you start, you know, look where, you know, Tom's look where Tom started, you know, skinny kid, uh, confident individuals. You look at different guys that have come into this league and said, Hey, look, you know, I'm the best thing you ever did or I'll be your quarterback. And if fate works it out that way, if injuries give you a chance to be able to prove your abilities, if the opportunity presents itself, you have to be ready. But no matter where you're drafted, uh, I could, like I said, I can relate to some of the journeys that some of these young guys have gone through, but I want to see what they're like when they get here. You know, now all of a sudden, see, too many guys think that becoming a professional is the, is the end. It's not. It's the beginning. You know, you've, you've worked your life to get to this dream moment. Now, what are you going to do with the dream moment? Are you going to take advantage of it? Or are you going to think that you deserve to be here and let that moment pass you by? Joe, I'm going to expose something here to you here that um, it's funny. I got drafted by the Bucks as a 56 player taken. My first day with that helmet, I look up at my locker and I go, what's next? <laughs> and I, and, and you know, you, you, you strive your whole life to get to that moment right. and you don't, you're kind of lost for a brief moment there. And like where you're drafted matters, Joe, when you go to a place like Washington, back when you had all those veteran guys, 
or when you go to a place that's been a consistent loser, how much does that really matter? And again, I hate to sound like my environment became part of the problem because I went from Miami where I never lost to a place where I lost 13 games in one season. Joe, right. that's more losses than I had in my entire high school and college career at one time. Yeah, and see, Dan, this is this is the important thing. What you just said is so important to understand. You you went someplace where you never lost. Now you're someplace where you're losing. It can't be about the this is something I would impress on every young person. It can't be about you. You were part of a team in Miami that never lost. You wound up in Tampa with a team that was struggling and they lost. Too often you place that burden on your own shoulders. It's like, hey, I'm not in this environment anymore. Oh, my God, look at the environment I'm in. To me, if you know why you were part of a winning environment. You observed what went on. That's why you do what you do today. That's why you're so wonderful and knowledgeable at things you share. But then you also understood what you looked at on a football team of why you weren't successful. So, and it's, you know, everybody sort of tends, this is such a me world. It's such an I world. It's I left this. I went from there. I went here. Uh, you know, but it's actually the team. We're the greatest team sport there is. I mean, there, there isn't anyone that relies more on everybody because there's so many numbers that are involved than our game, I believe. And, and when you, I didn't mean to interrupt you. When you said I went from here, I, it just, it just rang a bell for me that it isn't, it isn't an I it's we, and we didn't do this and we didn't do that. And how do I get better to help us get better? Those are, all, those are the way you have to, especially at the quarterback position. It's the most dependent position on the field. You've heard me say this, gosh knows how many times that we've done shows together. You rely on the line. You rely on receivers to catch the ball. You rely on defense to stop people. You rely on running backs to get you yardage. You rely on kickers to win games. There's You, you rely on everybody at this position. And if you're fortunate enough to be around a, a great bunch of guys, coaches, and a staff that's special and a, a system that fits you, um, then you get to enjoy some of the success that the team enjoys. And at this position as a quarterback, you automatically get the praise that goes with it. Joe, tell me how important this is. I mean, this, let's see now. At first it was Nick, then it was Shane Steichen, then it was Brian Johnson. Now he's got Kellen Moore. This will be his fourth coordinator. I'm talking Jalen Hurts. In three years starting, going into now his fourth season, having a different voice in your year, you you had Joe Gibbs, and yeah, obviously one of the greatest, if not the greatest coach. You can make the argument three different guys win Super Bowls. It wasn't one guy tied to one guy. He was a system in itself in developing of quarterbacks. Even worked in Tampa a little bit. Mm -hmm. You tell with Doug, you tell me how how hard is that to overcome when you're getting not a different message, but a different direction each and every single year. It, it's interesting. In this day and age, I don't think it's as difficult because you have guys with the portal. They're, they've got people. They since basically their sophomore year, they got a guy like Bo Nix. How many people have been in his ear? And Jalen did it. You remember, Jalen was at yeah. Alabama. Then he was at Oklahoma. Right. So I mean, you know, it's the X's and O's, the ins, the goes, the outs. They don't change. Just the terminology. So if if you're a good linguist. If you can learn languages, you can assimilate pretty easily because and then and the other thing you can do to a degree is you can take what the new coach is teaching and, and your mind begins to work like, well, this was like where I was before for Jalen. It would be like, well, this system that with Kellen there, this particular play, which it was called different, is similar to what we ran before. And then you start to put that together and it really broadens your language more than anything. But uh, I think having the ability to adapt and adjust uh, is very important. And, and the other thing is you want to get your ball. You want to get the ball out of your hands in a very timely fashion. Now coaches aren't going to put a place in there where you got to hold the ball a long time, not in this league anymore. No. You better not hold it a long time or else you're going to be holding on to it while you're lying on the ground. <laughs> That's just the way it is. You know, you know Joe, tell me, for you, because you were a mobile guy before your injury, you you were a mobile, and even after a little bit too, when you got back going there, uh, you were a mobile. 
when you're out there and a guy like Joe Gibbs calls a play, and I think Jalen needs to be more assertive because you even hear Andy Reid saying, hey, he's got free autonomy to change the play yeah. if he doesn't like something that he sees. You have the best vision of what you're looking at when you're trying to make a play work here. Um, how, how difficult was that for you to go, well, no, we're going to audible out of that, and we're going to go into this because – did, did, did Joe Gibbs give you that autonomy to do that? Or was that something that you and him had to have a conversation about after the game if you did do something about that? The reason I'm laughing is because Coach Gibbs called plays and Joe Theismann ran them. Um, okay? This was, this, was, this was not a democracy, all right? This wasn't like, well, what do you think, Coach? But actually, you know, during the week, uh, during the week, every now and then, Every now and then he would put something up and say, you know, what's your thoughts? But not very often. Joe had a Joe had a very specific plan. I had marching orders. But would see what he did. This was the genius of Joe. The way he would build the offense for us or the way he would build the routes for us. I had five places to go with the football. Now, it was on my shoulders to figure out which way to go based upon what the defense did. So it was a question of reading the defenses. And what we did is, and then Joe Bugle, our offensive line coach, and those five guys up front when it came to outside and counter tray and the running game that we had, they made the adjustments. You know, they slid to the backer. They, they went to the next level. They double teamed at a point of attack. So it was those things by the guys up front, me being able to figure out which, which one's supposed to get the ball. But the concept was all Joe's. It was all there. This is, this is what we're going to run. Now, if we get this, go here. If we get that, go here. If you get this look and we got an outside play call, I did have the ability to be able to get out of basically what would be a disastrous play into something that we thought would be a little bit better, but on a very limited basis. And and he just he was he was so creative. I mean, you know, we had we had plays for the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 17. We put in what was called an explode package because we knew Miami would match up corners on wide receivers, linebackers on backs and tight ends. So what he did is he had everybody in different positions when we got down around the goal line. The first touchdown that Alvin Garrett catches is, an, is part of an explode package. They were uncertain who to cover, so we managed to hit the fade for the touchdown. And, and that was, like I say, that was Joe. Um, but fundamentally, as a quarterback today, they give guys at the college level as well a lot more responsibility to get to the line, well, not even to the line of scrimmage, to get into the gun, take a look at what you've got, and then make a decision. I, I'm not a big fan. I think, you know, I, I watched Drew Brees play a lot of years. Got more yards than anybody in football. When Sean called plays, Drew ran him. I, I can tell you this. I, I would venture to guess that Drew Brees did not have a lot of flexibility in that offense. And that gives you a sense of confidence. Mm. There's no indecision. All right. I know what I have to run. There are five routes. I got to find the right one. That's the extent of the conversation you have in your head. When you're in the gun now and you see a tackle shaded a little bit inside and you're supposed to run inside. Now it's okay. Go. And then all of a sudden you change it and he slides back out. If I was, if I was a college defensive coordinator, you know what I would – this is to any college defensive coordinator out there, all right? When a team lines up at the line of scrimmage in college and the quarterback looks to the sidelines, shift your defense because the coaches are changing the plays. He's got to change the play. And all of a sudden now you will see more delay of game penalties than you've ever seen in college football in your life because they don't know – they wouldn't know what to do. Instead of just, hey, this is the basic pattern we're going to run – if the, if the tackle slides over, it turns into a defensive tackle slides over. It turns to a double team at the nose. And then we bring the guard around. If he doesn't, then we'll just single block it, slide the uh, tackle to the next level. In college, you're told where to throw the ball. In right. the pros, you got to know where your pre-snap breed is. You try is and anticipate it more, absolutely. Yeah, you've, you've got to know this. Joe, it sounds to me that because you didn't really – change that many plays or have to change many plays is that Gibbs was more of a guy who boutiqued an offense to your skill set so that the confidence level would be. And I wonder if a lot of coaches do that. Maybe that's why we're seeing a lot of these younger guys. Cause back in the day, there wasn't a ton of uh, Joe Gibbs's or their bill Walsh's where they would tailor an offense to a Steve, the versus a guy like a Montana or for you, 
it seems that that's what maybe separated those guys back then to where you're seeing more of that today. Is that fair to say why you're seeing more of these well, young coordinators? So. Not necessarily, Dan. I, th I think coaches will try and tailor it to the talent they have. I mean, let's look at the Tennessee Titans. They were not going to become a throwing football team with Derrick Henry. Uh, no. You know, but, you know, in, in that regard, whether you go one way or the other, you know, Cliff ran a lot of wide open offense in Arizona. I, I think you have to find the balance of what you have. Health plays into it. Do I have healthy running backs? Do I have healthy receivers? Do I have a healthy offensive line? Is my tight end capable of blocking on the, on the edge? You know, those are all things that I think you find out as a coach. Um, I think a lot of coaches, you know, you'll get options. It isn't like you've got this five play menu. You know, you spend a lot of time in practice. You spend more time in meetings than you do in practices. Yeah. Going over looks. If you get this look, this is what you want. If you get that look, this is what you want. But you'll spend a lot of time looking at the film, looking, listening to things at, as far as meetings go. In practice, you don't get a whole lot. Of, they don't spend a whole lot of time on the field anymore. Hour 45, some of it's stretching. You get about 30 plays on offense, 30 plays on defense, 60 plays basically uh, of regular offense and, and defense, infield stuff. Then you get to red zone and goal line and short yardage, sprinkle in another 15, 45 plays, you're done with practice. 90 plays is, is basically the meat of your practice week. Um, and so to be able to or try to look for too many things, I think creates confusion, especially with young people. I think I've shared this with you before. Tom Moore, who's one of the greatest people in the world, as well as coaches. I remember sitting with Tom when he first got Peyton in Indianapolis. And he said, I'm, there's two things I'm not going to do to Peyton. I'm not going to let him get beat up physically, and I'm not going to let him get beat up mentally. And so he designed routes to get the ball out of Peyton's hand. And you, with, with his entire 20-odd year, year career, when he, you always saw him get the ball out of his hands. You never saw him really take a shot. I, you could probably count on one hand, if you went back and looked at film, how many times Peyton took a shot. Standing there holding the ball, yeah. and somebody just knocked the living daylights out of him. And, and, you know, that lends to a long career. Tom was the same way. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, Marvin Harrison as a receiver. When people got close to Marvin in the middle of the field, if they ran an in route, he'd just go down. Why? You're going, to take, you're going to take shot after shot. People are going to try and pull the ball away. The object of this game for players is to be able to play and practice every day so you can get better. That's what the object of this game is. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. You put on a professional uniform, you're already there. Now, can you stay there? That's the question. Joe, when did you gain personally your most confidence in that you were established in the NFL after you won the Super Bowl or after you won your MVP? Um, actually, because they're two different. Yeah, it is, but you know, it's 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 neither of those. Okay. Huh. Um. In, interestingly enough, in 1979, I became the starter. 1978, I played. 1979. Um. When we played take the over for, was it Kilmer? I took over for Billy. Yeah. Sonny, Sonny retired. Uh, I got there in 74, Sonny retired 75, Billy played 76, 77. Then I played mostly in 78. I, you know, the early years, cause I didn't play. You didn't know I, I could throw it around. I felt like I could play, but you never got into game situations. And then there's game situations. And then there's longevity. There's four game situations. And then there's 16, 17 game situations where you have to last through. But I've always, it's a question of validation. Real quick story. When I was at South River High School, we used to play New Brunswick on Thanksgiving Day. They were a big football team. They lost very few games. We lost very few games. If I played well against them, I belonged in my mind. Then I went to the University of Notre Dame, played a lot of football there, played two and a half years there, two, two years and three games. And then we played the University of Southern California. They became my barometer by which I measured my abilities. Did I belong as a college quarterback? Was I, was I good enough to be able to play at this level? And then when I became a professional football player, it became the Dallas Cowboys because they'd won championships. They had so many great players. And if I could fare well against them, then I belonged. So I would say, you know, in, in those years, late 78, 79, when we played the Cowboys and, and we had success and I personally was able to do some things, that's when I felt like I belonged. Prior to that, I didn't know. So it was levels. 
it, you you were yeah. you were climbing a ladder. Yeah, and validation ladder. Was the validation ladder you were climbing. Yeah, you know, you val and I think and I think people look for validation in your life. It's like you know, you and I do a show, and somebody says, "Man, Dan, that was some great questions." There's validation. You know, you, you feel you go, yeah, I got, I, I, that feels good, man. I got, got, got another great guest coming up. Got to talk to somebody. And, and I just come off of some really good questions and you move on. I, I think our life is a series of validations to a degree. I, I, I like learning different things about you each and every single time that we get you on. And it, it, it's a great testament on how the quarterback mind works, too, because I always wonder, I mean, like it always looked like Brady was chasing the never ending finish line. It just was like that finish line, Joe, that is never going to happen for him. He's never happy with anything. I think sometimes you guys are the most miserable people on the planet <laughs> because quarterbacks, how in the world can you be happy it's when so you have so much? It's almost like sometimes, Joe, the quarterbacks in today or the quarterbacks that have had great success like Peyton and Brady, yourself, you guys never look up. And when you look up, that's probably when it's over. And you think when you get so much. And then when you get off the field, you think you get a break, but you really don't. <laughs> right, because then you're back in it's the like, meetings. There's, no, there's, there's the nowhere to run and hide. There's nowhere to run and hide. It's like, it's like here's the game. Oh, okay, here's more of the game. Okay, I got to wake up. Here's some more of the game. But, yeah, it's uh, – I, I think we've all wanted to chase excellence. I mean, that's – you put the uniform on to be great, not to be good. You know, I, I, why, why just settle for average? I'm not a – I'm not a big fan of average. If you can't do something to the best of your ability and try and be the best, you know, you don't always have to achieve that ultimate goal. But as long as you keep striving, if you, as long as you keep pushing to be the best, it, it's easy. I, I got to tell you a little story about that. Um, I just saw LT the other yesterday at an autograph session. So we were sitting visiting, and and How I tell this story. How was that relationship? How was that relationship? Oh, it's fine. I just don't let him stand on my left side where I can't see him. It's, you know, other wow. than that, other than that, we got You're a great, when we play golf. I have, when we play golf, he has to be in my vision. <laughs> um, it's, it's just simple, but I remember he had a, a bar up and uh, play a restaurant bar up in Jersey. And he invited me up one about four years after the injury. And we sat, we're sitting there visiting and they played the injury behind us. And um, I turned to LT and I said, Hey T look, we're always going to be connected through this injury. We know how it affected me. It ended my career. How did it affect you? He said, Joe, I learned a great lesson that night. That no matter how great you are, what you do, it can be over in an instant. And that every day you got to try and be the best you can possibly be. And you can't wait till tomorrow to try and be that good. And, and to me, I think that's just, I think it's just a wonderful general lesson for people in life is don't wait till tomorrow. Go after, go after your dreams today. And believe me, your dreams can come true. They did for me, this skinny little kid out of South River, New Jersey. Um, you know, went to college at 155 pounds, won a Super Bowl at 185 and, and played 15 years of professional football and, and had the greatest experiences of my life because of the people I played with and the coaches I had a chance to play for. That's what you miss. I, know, I guarantee you, that's what you, you miss the locker room just as much as I miss the locker room. The, the, the things that took place in the locker room, the interaction, the conversations. And of course we used to get away with a lot more stuff than they do today. I mean, Social media. <laughs> it, it was, oh it God. was, you know, it was the wild, wild West in there. And yeah, we're like a family every now and then there'd be a, a, a dust up a little bit, but the big boys would come in and separate it and say, you go to that corner, you go to that corner. <laughs> Absolutely. Joe, well, you know, I've always kind of stayed away from that, though, and I've known many people, Jim Burton, all those guys who are on that field that night. You're laying on your back at RFK, and you're looking up, and you you probably didn't know everyone else told me that was on the field that day. I've never asked you what were your – all the things that you'd accomplished, MVP, Super Bowl appearances, wins, and there you are with pieces of your body right there at RFK. I mean, what – and how did you overcome that? How hard was that to overcome? I've never spoken to you about this. Um, what was that like for you, man? I mean, I don't want you to – I'm sorry I'm asking you, but oh, – No, that's okay. I've, I mean, always, I, listen, I've always wanted to know. Every every element of my life, every story, there's a lesson that that I can either share or something I learned from. That, that night, uh, first of all, I could hear the – I could hear my leg break. 
As a matter of fact, you could hear it on television. It sounds they like two muzzle guns. They told me guys who were on the Giants told me it was like a, a bat hitting a trash can. Yeah, it's like two muzzle gunshots to me. And and instantly, the body, you find out just how, how magnificent the body is. From the knee down, my leg was completely numb. Um, I did not see. I just, I was on the ground. I didn't see what was going on were around me. Pardon? Were you in oh, pain? The pain was excruciating initially. And then all of a sudden, I had no pain whatsoever. I don't know how long it lasted, but you know, when it the instant it was broken, it was it was excruciating. And then all of a sudden, from the knee down, my leg is completely numb. And I can still right off my left ear, I can I see Bubba Tire, our trainer, and Bubba's kneeling down. I said, Bubba, call my mom, tell her I'm okay. That's first, that's first words out of my mouth. And then they start to put me on the stretcher and I they start wheeling me out of the stadium and I stopped the stretcher because I had heard that Harry Carson was thinking about retiring. So I had him stop the stretcher, turn to Harry. I said, Harry, I understand you're thinking about retiring. He says, yeah, I am, Joe. I said, well, don't you go retiring because I'm coming back. He said, that may be the case, pal, but it ain't going to be tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that whole night has a series of stories. I watched the, when they were putting my leg back together, I had him bring in a black and white TV with a coat hanger in it so I could watch the rest of the game as they were working on my leg. And, um, I just, I love this game so much. I have such a passion uh, for the young guys today. And, you know, I, I hope that the young guys put everything into this game today so that they can get some of the feeling that I was fortunate to, to be able to have as a part of a very, very special group of guys. But, you know, put, there's nothing like putting that uniform on for the first time. It, right, Danny? I mean, oh. you put that uniform on. You talk about I'll looking up at the locker. I helmet, Joe, under my arm, and I'm at Tampa Stadium. We're playing in 87, the Bears. As, actually, you broadcast one of the first years of yep. your broadcasting career. You did my packer Bucks game up at the old Milwaukee right. Fulton County Stadium. You and some guy up there did a game up there. It may have even been uh, James Brown that uh, you guys – Actually, it was it was Tim Ryan. I was my it. first broadcast, and then I had the good fortune to work with one of the greatest broadcasters in the history of of sports, Jack Buck. Right, and I Jack. Got, but, but uh, that when that, when the planes flew over from McDill, and it was the first time I cried because yeah. I was like, I can't believe I'm standing here on an NFL football <laughs> stadium, and I just was drafted, and I got my helmet under my arm, and I'm looking up, I'm going. And I said it, Joe, I went, what the F am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I just could not believe. It is surreal. It it's really surreal is. surreal that you just remember the moment that you put that gear on. And then you're like this. Holy shit, there's Walter Payton. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, here's one for you. I got, I got a real quick one for you. So my first start, Kansas City Chiefs here at, at, uh, at uh, RFK. So Willie Lanier is the middle linebacker. And Willie used to wear a helmet that had a special shell over the top of it, like a hitting shell. I'll never forget getting up under the, under the center. And all I'm doing is I'm staring. I'm staring at Willie. I'm going, oh, my God. That's <laughs> Willie Lanier. Five-yard penalty, delay a game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Just a couple last questions for you, Joe, on the modern co uh, commanders right now. Do you like – Jaden Daniels. Yes, I do. I, I liked him at LSU. Um, Mike Denbrook, who was his offensive coordinator at LSU, was also at the University of Notre Dame previously. So I got to, you know, spend a little time with Mike, talk to him a little bit about Jaden. I like him very much. I like his demeanor. Um, he, you know, everything that I understand is he's a young man who's willing to learn. He understands that he has to learn. That's vitally important. Um, people say, well, you know, he's six, four, he's two ten, he's thin. Hey, Tom Brady was no, you know, <laughs> giant of a guy. I mean, Tom was, he's, he's narrower now than he was when he played. But, uh, I think you learn to protect yourself. You learn how to slide. You learn to run out of bounds. I, I, I tell young quarterbacks this all the time. Your job, your number one job is to be available to play in practice. Because then you get better. You're not going to learn anything standing on the sidelines. You're not going to learn anything in, in the uh, training room. Out on the fields where you're going to learn everything. And so every snap you can take, every minute you can look at yourself on film and have yourself and the coaches determine what you need to do to get better. And so, yeah, I think he's that kind of a young man. And, of course, Sam Hartman is here as well, uh, Notre Dame quarterback from uh, from a while ago. And Jeff Driscoll, I believe, is also here. So I got some uh, – 
pretty young stable of guys. And it looks like about 50% of this football team is going to start for the commanders that uh, hadn't been on the team before. They'll be young. They'll be new. Uh, I, I think Dan Quinn's an incredible coach. There's a great sense of energy and enthusiasm. They're going through OTAs now, and I think everybody's excited about where this football team's going to go. You know, um, they were – I had Herm Edwards on, and Herm loves uh, Jaden Daniels. because He had him at coach. ASU. He had him at ASU, and yeah. he came into the office and said, Coach, I got it. And he goes, I want you to. He goes, Dan, this guy here is so aware – of his surroundings and what he wants to do. I mean, he's prepared. He's like, from what I heard, and then I even heard Dan Quinn these last couple of days saying, he's got a plan for everything, Joe. He's like, he's compartmentalized everything. His yeah. practice, his, his how, he, how he watches film, how he eats, how he goes out of his way with his teammates. So he's kind of, you know, departmentalizing all of this. And I think that's great because that shows me a guy with a plan. You know who's just like that? Tom Kirk Brady. Cousins. Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins, right? Kirk, Kurt has Kurt has Kirk has his day down to the to the second. Have you been surprised by his career? Pardon? Have you been surprised by his career? No, not at all. Played the way he has, because he's been outstanding. Not at all. I'm not the least bit surprised. When I I was broadcasting preseason games when Robert Griffin III was drafted in one and Kirk was drafted in the fourth round. And uh, Kirk coming out of Michigan State was just ready. He reminded me of um, of um, luck when Take he came out. I mean, you could just see that they were ready. I mean, they got the ball out of their hands. They read the defense quickly. Uh, they made good decisions. That's the way Kirk was coming out of state. It's the way he went through his career. And, you know, I don't know if he has sent the, sent the general manager. I'm trying to think of who it was that told him that he needed to prove more. So Kirk wound up leaving and going into a $300 million uh, rest of his career. God bless him. Good 350. For him. He's made more money than Brady well, as a starting him. quarterback. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, that that's, you know, yes. But, um, and Kirk is, I think Kirk was ready from day one. He, and you know what? When you watch him play the game today and go back and watch him early in Washington, you, you don't see a whole lot of difference. Huh. The ball comes out as quick, makes good decisions, uh, knows how to protect himself. I mean, the Achilles wasn't necessary, wasn't a hit. Right. It was just one of those things. It's like the same thing with Aaron. You know, it was it wasn't a hit, it was a movement. Um, so, but uh Kirk was like that. He Every minute of the day was laid out and still is to this day. And, uh, you know, I, I just hope he has a lot of success. I think Atlanta's going to be a, a much better football team than they were. They're pretty good defensively. They're, rece they're receiving core is the tallest I've ever seen in football. Uh, and I, I just want to see Kirk be healthy, be strong. I think they'll win that division. And um, Arthur, you know, Arthur Blank is just a special kind of a man. So I'd like to see it happen for him too. Tom Brady, you mentioned it, and I have to ask you, you know, was it hard for you? Because I know talking to Troy, Troy Aikman, when he first got into the booth, he said, you know, ripping our boys and ripping our friends was kind of one of the harder things that I had to overcome was sitting there starting to talk some trash and some people. And I had to be critical. And I, I remember telling Troy, you're going to lose friendships when you do this because not everybody's going to be able to take it. Remember, you know what a locker room is. And so I'm wondering how Brady's going to be able to do that. Cause Tom loves, you know, he's a great teammate. Yeah. Joe, was that hard for you to have to be with criticism when you were doing Monday night? Well, Dan, I think the criticism part was taken care of with Tom. When you watch the roast. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't, you know, none of that will Not be me. on regular. None of that will be on regular television. I promise you that. But I think all of uh, everything was sort of understood. No, what was interesting to me, about that was first of all, you have to learn to talk in sound bites. You can't go rambling yeah. on to try and explain stuff. But my mom told me a long, long time ago, and I quoted in the book, I call them momisms. It's never what you say, it's how you say it. In other words, you can, you, I wouldn't call it criticism. I would call it analysis of a play. Huh. So let's say, you know, let's say one of the guys he plays with, you know, let's say Mike Evans runs, runs the wrong route. Um, Cause you know, Tom basically will understand what's going on. That's one of the advantages of the young guys getting in. They know the systems. 
sometimes it's a disadvantage because you almost know too much. Um, so let's say Mike runs the wrong route. And, and Tom and say, well, you know, and he blew that route. No, there was a way of presenting and saying, it looks like he tried to anticipate where the quarterback was going to go and the quarterback might have changed at the last minute. It's, if you want to call it a criticism, it's not. It's just an analysis of the play. That's why we're called analysts, not criticizers. <laughs> Absolutely. Joe, I leave you with this. My um, uncle who coached your team, uh, or well, my uncle who played for Lombardi when he was an assistant coach in New York, Andy Robustelli, was given a card by Lombardi. It said, we are going to do everything in our power to strive for perfection, knowing full well we'll never reach it. Right. But we're going to learn to live with greatness. And I have that framed, and it makes me think now even more so of you. And I'm so glad that you're doing things outside of football, your restaurant. You're working with my friend Todd Cal now on this new yep. venture that you have, working with the Looking NBA. For safety oh, in the game, right. By the way, I gave him um, Adam Silver's cell phone and uh, his email address. I said, hey, who would have thunk? I go, if you knew Theismann, Todd. I would have given you more info on some of the guys in the NBA, but now that I know you know Joe, we're in. I've known those guys. I work for those guys, believe it or not. Great guys. Earth. Great guys. Love those guys. Great concept, too, we're working on. Someday we can get into that. Absolutely. Joe, thank you so much, my friend, for always finding time. You're absolutely, truly one of my dear friends, and I thank you again. God bless you, my friend. We'll talk soon. I enjoy it always, Dan. Thank you for having me. You bet. The great Joe Theismann. Absolutely sensational talking to Joe. Please do me a favor, folks. Make sure you hit the like button. We will have Gary Cobb coming up, too. Our friend from Fox 29 in Philadelphia. He's at a golf tournament. Now, there's going to be a bunch of guys there with the um, with, with the Eagles, I think Giants, and maybe even former Redskins are going to be there, too. So we appreciate it. Please hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.